There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night roam free and things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Mr. Tim Dennis. Good evening, Tim. Good evening, Dave. Well, a big congratulations are in order for your lovely little sister, Stephanie, after getting married last week. Yay. Very nicely done. Uh, so Tim was not able to join me last week as I was out in Santa Paula, California at the Glen Tavern Inn, the purportedly haunted Glen Tavern Inn. Although I got to tell you, Tim, here's yeah. an update. I'm probably going to piss a lot of people off by saying this. The only spirits there were at the bar? <clears throat> well, there were a lot of spirits flowing at the bar. Huh. Uh, I don't think it's haunted. Do you want to know why? Well, why? The electricity pouring through that place is so incredibly high. Chris Fleming went into his room the first night, and he calls me up. He goes, dude, did somebody die in my room? I go, why does it smell? He goes, no. He goes, <laughs> I, can't, I can't relax. I can't concentrate. My head is buzzing. It it. He goes, it, it feels like there was a violence here or something. He goes, but it's not. He goes, it's the same kind of feeling I get when there's something violent that happened in the room. However, it's not that. There's something off, Dave. I can't figure out what it is. So after a little bit, he broke out his EMF detector. And it was spiking anywhere between a 10 to a 20 milligauss of electricity Ooh. running by his head Yikes. in the bedroom. So, so Chris now has brain cancer. Yes. Oh, great, great. Yes, it's the gift that keeps on giving at these conventions. Aww. So we started doing baseline readings. My room was spiking again. Anywhere in the room, just walk around. It was spiking between 10 to 20 milligauss of electricity. Nice. Or electromagnetic field, however you want to look at it. So I think that may lead to a lot of the hallucinatory hauntings that might be taking place there. I'm trying to be polite in my call on it. That's just my call. I hear you. There was a lot of people there, you know, and some were feeling things in the psychics. But even Chris said, Dave, a lot of this can be misconstrued because of the electromagnetic fields. Mm. And, and it was crazy high. Um, I had uh, uh, at one point my room was supposed to be haunted and there was a group of people down in the lobby that didn't have a place to ha hunt. So I sent them up to my room and they all came down going, holy crap, how are you sleeping in there? The electricity's through the roof and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that might be part of it. Plus, the walls are so thin. You can literally hear people in the next room talking, you know, just in a normal voice. Hmm. And there's uh, uh, like an apartment complex directly behind the Glen Tavern Inn. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a fiesta going on there that whole weekend. And nice. you could just hear music bleeding through the walls. It sounded like literally like somebody was outside my third story window with a boombox. So hmm. I think a lot of the evidence might be. How do you know it was a fiesta? Um, it was a Hispanic neighborhood. Ah. It was a Hispanic party, mm -hmm. and I was going with the only Mexican word I knew that, or Hispanic <laughs> word I knew that that was for party. It was a fiesta, ah. and I learned that from uh, Hola, senor. Lionel Richie, isn't it? Come on, yeah, fiesta. Yeah. All right, forever. Uh, so we've got that going. I, I had a great time. It was so fun meeting everybody. I got to do my first uh, talk at one of the events, and we did a fun little. Um, uh, discussion with Chris Fleming and Patrick Burns talking about the use of psychics on, an, on a paranormal investigation versus using technology and how sometimes relying on either one too much can really screw people up. We realized that so many people in the room agreed with us and, and even Chris and Patrick admitted that a lot of times they are so tuned into their own feelings or their equipment they forgot to look up to actually see if anything's going on in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because that's where I come in. I think that a lot of investigations, you got to rely on what you see and hear. Mm -hmm. And then if you can back it up with the technology, once you see something, then go for the cold spot, you know, try to try to go that way. So we were just talking about that. We had a great time. Uh, some really gr great talks out there. Richard Sennett was there, and Richard's going to be on our show in a few weeks. We've got, uh, you know, uh, you've got Derek from Capers. Uh, you've got Derek Bartlett, who's a fantastic speaker as well. Um, 
A lot of a lot of really good guys. Tom Durant, who I want to have on to talk a little bit more about shadow people. He had a very interesting talk. We had uh, Chris and Patrick, of course. And for those of you that aren't aren't too up on this yet, you know, one of the biggest bones people have had about haunting evidence is that, that there's no follow up because they go in to try to you know get this cold case reinvigorated. But it, there is actually one of the episodes that they've helped solve because of some of the information that John Oliver was able to provide. Mm. So that is cool. So there are updates. So keep watching Haunting Evidence on Wednesday nights. If you can't watch it Wednesdays, they do repeat it on Sunday nights on the uh, Court TV channel, which will be tra- uh, tuning to, I think it's True TV soon. Really? Yeah, it's going to be changing names. And speaking of John Oliver, we have some exciting news. First of all, I want to remind everybody, you only have for the rest of tonight's show to take advantage of the special deal being offered by the Eclectic Celtic. Uh, at eclecticceltic.com. They are doing a special for us that started last Sunday night during our show and runs through the end of tonight's show. You can save $60 off of going to Waverly Hills Sanitarium with Tim and I, Chris, Patrick, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, John Zaffis, Chad Kalick, and he'll be there uh, with some exciting news about his new uh, venture. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got Adam Bly, the demono- demonologist, will be there. Uh, ghost hunting legend Patty Starr will be there. We've got Tiffany Johnson and Chip Coffee are going to be there. Right now, if you go sign up through the rest of tonight's show, you save $60 off the cost of tickets. We want to thank our good friends at the eclecticceltic.com for doing that special offer for the seven-day period. Um, We also, after tonight's show, tickets, are you ready, Tim? I'm ready. Tickets are officially going on sale tonight. For Led Zeppelin reunion tour. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. We're actually putting tickets on sale for the next Stanley event, which is probably the most highly anticipated event of the year for us. We're going back to the Stanley in November, 15th through the 18th of November. We're going to be out there investigating with, check out this lineup, mm-hmm. Jason Hawes, Grant Wilson from the Ghost Hunters, okay. Chris Fleming from Dead Famous, All right. Patrick Burns from Haunting Evidence, and for the first time ever at a Darkness Radio event, mm-hmm. John Oliver, the psychic detective from the TV show Haunting Evidence, will be on hand talking to us about the use of psychics in criminal investigations. Nice. So that's going to be great. We also have UFOlogist James Gilliland, who's going to be our hour, or hour two guest this evening, will be on hand to talk to us about UFOs, what's going on in the world, and he's going to show you some startling evidence. I had a chance to go out to his ranch. We'll talk about that in the second hour. Um, it's going to be great. We've got Rosemary Ellen Guiley. John Zaffis is going to be there. Uh, Bill Murphy is going to be doing a talk for us a couple of nights as well. So we've got uh, some really fascinating stuff going on. Jay Allen, Danilek, Mark Macy. Uh, it's going to be jam-packed full of fun. Plus, we get a meal at the Stanley, and uh, we're going to be doing another charity auction. And I just want to thank all of our listeners and all the people that have joined in because of the uh, four or five events that we've now done where we've been doing charity auctions. Tim, our grand total that we have helped raise for charity with the Darkness Radio Taps Paranormal Retreats is a little over $32,000. That ain't no small change. That's no small change at all, my that friend. We're no doing some change. business out there helping out people. So uh, thank you very much to all of you for being so giving at these events, donating your time and money to be a part of them, donating some beautiful autograph merchandise. I happen to know at Waverly, I just obtained a David Duchovny autograph. Oh. Jillian Anderson, also known as Agent nope. Scully. Duchovny from Red Shoe Diaries? Or? <laughs> yes, exactly. No, oh, it's nice. David Duchovny from the... Uh, X-Files picture autographed by David Duchovny. We've got one of Jillian Anderson Scully mm-hmm. autographed. We also have Jody Foster autographed picture from Silence of the Lambs. So we've got some cool items coming up for Waverly. Uh, but we're going to keep doing this every place we go. We're going to be raising money to help different local charities and uh, local events. So please come with an open heart and a big wallet and ready to spend some money to make changes. Appreciate your help with that. I want to mention again, Waverly Hills is on sale right now. We've only got three weeks before Waverly. I think we're down to only about 20 tickets left. That's going to go really well. Stanley is going to go fast. It's the most highly anticipated event we have going on this year. So if you want to get on it, get on it quick because they are going to move. You can find that information at www.darknessevents.com on all of our trips. And don't forget the Queen Mary. We're down to, I think there's only about 40 tickets left to the Queen Mary right now, Tim. These are going really fast, which is surprising. We're still, you know five months away from the Queen Mary event, Mm -hmm. and we're almost completely sold out. So make sure, if you want to attend any of these events, sign up quick, be a part of it. 
Want to thank everybody for tuning in with us this evening. I uh, want to make a quick mention on a new story and mention to you, too. Univcon is coming up. And Univcon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you do it like Dave Chappelle when he's playing Rick James. Hey. Univcon. We are going to uh, be out at Univcon this year. Um, I'm going to be hosting the Darkness Debate, where we're going to be debating uh, with two very prominent paranormal figures. Uh, we're going to be doing a debate there, and I'll be moderating. So make sure that you tune out for that. Uh, and that's also tune out, tune out, <laughs> well, turn out, turn out, tune out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, turn out for that. You can get information about Unifcon, which, in my opinion, is one of the best, if not the best, paranormal conference in America right now. You can go out there. It's at uh, Penn State College uh, in State College, Pennsylvania. They are having Jason and Grant. They're having Chris Fleming, Patrick Burns. They've got uh, the lovely Lorraine Warren will be there. They've got, and his name escapes me right now, but the author of The Mothman Prophecies are going to be there. James Randy. James lights out Randy. Really? Yes. <laughs> James the Skeptic, the Amazing Randy. He's going to debunk the entire conference. He is. He's there to tell <laughs> us all. So James Randy is going to be out there. Uh, got some great speakers. Lloyd Auerbach is going to be doing um, a talk out there as well. You've got uh, Carl and Keith Johnson, the demonologists that you've seen on shows like Ghost Hunters will be out there. Uh, Michelle Bellinger, who we've had on the show in the past, will be there talking about vampires. So uh, make sure that you check that out. You can go to Penn State. P-R-S dot com. That's Penn State, P-R-S dot com. And uh, click there for their links to learn more about the events and get tickets. Those are selling out. You can get some of the gold tickets. I think I still have a couple left, a couple of the silver passes. So get out there, have a fun time with us. I uh, look forward to seeing you. Let's get into tonight's news story before we talk to our first guest. I, I just saw this, Tim. i got to bring it up. Mm-hmm. The, the news story that I'm looking at right now on MSNBC is attempted exorcism ends in man's death. Uh-oh. Police use stun guns on grandfather seen choking three-year-old girl. Phoenix, officers responding to a report of an exorcism on a young girl found her grandfather choking her and used stun guns to subdue the man who later died, authorities said Sunday. The three-year-old girl and her mother, who, uh, who was also in the room during the struggle between 49-year-old Ronald Marquez and officers, were hospitalized, police said. Their condition was unavailable. The relative who called police said an exorcism had also been attempted Thursday. The purpose was to release demons from the very young girl, said Sergeant Joel Tranter. Officers arrived at the house Saturday and entered when they heard screaming coming from a bedroom, Tranter said. Uh, a bed had actually been pushed up against the door. The officers pushed it open a few inches and saw Marquez choking his uh, bloodied granddaughter, who was crying in pain and gasping. A bloody, naked 19-year-old woman who police later determined to be Marquez's mother and, uh, or I'm sorry, Marquez's daughter and the girl's mother was in the room chanting something that was in religious in nature, Tranter said. The officers forced open the door enough for one to enter, leading to a struggle in which an officer used a stun gun on Marquez. Now uh, the mother may be charged after the initial stun had no visible effect. Another officer squeezed into the room and stunned him. The girl was freed and passed through the door to the relative. Uh, Marquez was placed in handcuffs after a struggle with officers and initially appeared normal, but then stopped breathing. Tranter said he uh, could not be revived and was pronounced dead at the hospital. Tranter declined to identify Marquez's daughter and granddaughter, but they said they lived in the house with Marquez. The mother was not arrested, but police will consider criminal charges later. There was no phone listing at Ronald Marquez's address, according to this, which is good because we don't need people calling up for that. But uh, how crazy is that? I mean... You know, choking the girl? Haven't they watched the movies? All you need is some holy water and rosaries, isn't that's that right. it? That's right. Well, we're going to find out if that's really what you need when we talk to our first guest here. And our first guest is Father Andrew Calder. And he's the founder and director of GPRT, the Georgia Paranormal Research Team. And Father Calder has lived in a haunted home, experienced firsthand paranormal phenomena. He's uh, served many years in the capacity of law enforcement officer, serving for both city and state agencies, and as a private investigator specializing in video surveillance. And uh, Mr. Calder has been a member of other paranormal investigative groups serving uh, middle Georgia and surrounding areas. And Mr. Calder is also an ordained priest with the uh, Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches. His knowledge in the area of the occult, witchcraft, psychic abilities, tarot, Ouija board, and other means associated with the phenomena make him an Uh, a real asset to any paranormal team. And tonight we're going to explore the paranormal from a religious standpoint. Does the church believe in UFOs, reincarnation, ghosts, Bigfoot? I mean, we can guess Father Calder probably knows uh, he believes in it because he's involved in this type of investigation, but we're going to talk to him because we've had such a a high response for people wanting to know what is religion's take on the paranormal. So hopefully we'll find that out. Welcome to the show, Father Calder. 
Thank you very much, Dave. I'm glad to be on your show this evening. Oh, we appreciate having you. I know we've tried to hook up in the past here, and things are always kind of keeping us apart, and I'm glad we finally found the time to get together and have you on here. Uh, I, I originally contacted you. I wanted you to talk about, uh, we've had demonologists on before and talked about exorcisms and, and crazy stuff, and I know mm-hmm. you're, you're one of the big names out in the field. Right. Um, I wanted to kind of stay away from that on this talk just to talk about the different uh, thoughts going on in the paranormal field uh, according to religious standards. And uh, you were kind enough to agree to come on. So we will have you back on in the future to discuss demonology and some of the cases that you've worked on. Sure. Um, but I definitely want to I want to touch it base with this. Now, with that article we just read, um, have you, uh, first of all, had you heard that news story yet? That's the first I've heard of it, and I'd have to say that's pretty remarkable with what went on with that family. Um, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of stories out there in the different Protestant-type communities you hear about someone being beat to death or wrapped in a wet blanket or something of that nature. You know, people just dying for ungodly type reasons, and this is where exorcism goes totally off off kilter here. Right. Um, there's no checks and balances there to make sure that people don't have, you know, um, paranoid or psychotic type um, episodes, you know, which the family itself could have, you know, psychological problems. The girl herself could have psychological problems. Um, we have no idea if the exorcism was successful or not, if it, there was supposedly a follow-up exorcism to be done, you know, by the priest, by the church, or whatever. There's just a lot of unknown issues there. A lot of curiosity. I mean, if this guy was hit twice with tasers and it didn't knock him down, they actually left with him, and then all of a sudden he died, do you think that that could be a demonic influence that finally took his life, or do you think the adrenaline level finally dropped enough that... Well, when you were talking about that, one of the first things I thought of was that the entity itself could have transferred to the grandfather. Okay. Um, so that could have been one of the reasons why it took several stun attempts to take him down. All right. Now, so, I'm not, I don't know without knowing the details, but that's right. just a, an educated guess to some degree. How often, how often do you think that there are deaths attributed to, quote-unquote, exorcisms? I mean, isn't that the, the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, was based on that, right? The, the accidental murder of... The girl during an exorcism, or the accidental death, I should say, of right. the girl during an exorcism. Is that is that a lot more prevalent out there than we know about? I wouldn't say it's more prevalent. It does happen in a rare percentage of cases out there. I would say probably less than you know three or four percent of the cases that come up. Most of the ones have to be approved, put through stringent medical, psychological issues, you know, so stuff like that does not happen. Right. Well, now that's what I want to kind of lead into with. Now, I know that you said that, you know, a lot of testing should be done, and I know before most churches will involve themselves in a quote-unquote exorcism, they have to put the people through pretty rigorous testing, right? They, they check psychological, they check, you know, uh, physical and, and different problems that this person may be having before they just elect to send in Father Marin to go take out the spirits, right? Well, if you're talking from a Catholicism point of view, that's pretty much required a psychological workup has to be done on the person. A medical, a full medical evaluation has to be done to try to rule out any psychological or physiological issues that could, you know, be mistaken for, you know, demonic possession. Okay. Now, in the Protestant world, I'd have to say that a lot of them do not put th- put them through that kind of stringent stringent issues. But I do usually require, especially children, mm-hmm. you know, to be tested highly, you know, for psychological issues. Well, make, just go ahead. We know then that the, the churches do take stock in demon-related issues and, and things of this nature. And I know, having uh, talked to the, the pastor at my own church, he has been called out to bless homes that people felt were haunted and has right. had to, in his, his words, cast out spirits that didn't belong there mm-hmm. uh, by evoking the name Jesus Christ. So we know that, that the church has some parameters already set in place for things like uh, ghosts and demons. What what about, we had a young lady on a few weeks ago named Sherry Laird, who is believed to be the reincarnated soul of Marilyn Monroe. And she has a psychiatrist who's backing her up on it, friends of Marilyn's that back her up, that she knows some information there's no other way she could know about. What is the church's stance on reincarnation? I mean, I know that we all believe... We're, we die, and if we live a good life, we're going to go to our just rewards in heaven. And if we didn't, we've got other plans <laughs> right. waiting for us. Uh, but I don't recall, you know, growing up Lutheran and, and going through Lutheran grade school, I don't recall there being 
And then God said, you shall go back down to earth and live all over again. So, I, you know, I, I don't know what the stance of the church is on reincarnation. Do you believe that that does occur? Or is it, I, I guess, and instead of your belief, we'll get to that in a minute, but what is the church's belief? Is there reincarnation or does reincarnation usually mean that there's some kind of trick being played by demon, uh, demonic or, or uh, the devil? Well, sometimes that can be a case. Okay. But you will find most of the times the church, and when I say the church, you're talking about mostly Catholic and most of the well-known denominations do not recognize um, reincarnation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, their staunch is, you know, when you die, you know, you're going immediately to heaven or to hell. Um, there's no in-between phases. There's no purgatory, anything like that. Um, you will find that there's some mention that they say that during the time that Jesus from the time he was 13 to 33, that there's really no written re- record of him in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And there's some theories out there that there was lost years where he went to different countries, learned different things from different monks and monasteries. Is there any truth to the rumor he followed the Grateful Dead during that time? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> he probably would have fit right in, you know. But <laughs> This year on the CW, Jesus, the Lost Years. <laughs> But there, there, there is some theories out there, you know, that during that time that he learned a lot, a lot of his abilities and things that he did, you know, during that time. But there's no actual proof of that. It's just hearsay. Um, but it, you know, just to kind of re- recant that, the church's staunch our view on reincarnation is it doesn't exist. That it does not exist. No. Now, in your investigations in the world of the paranormal, what are your stances on on reincarnation? Well, I have to admit that I have worked with a number of people out there that, through hypnotic regressions and things of this nature, you know, actually scientifically documented type stuff, that there seem to be some interesting correlations, you know, between the the past lives and so forth that these people talked about, um, that there seem to be some validity to it. I mean, you could actually trace them down to actual dates, times, years. And these were things that could be traced back to, you know, local cemeteries, local um, registries within the community that show these people actually existed, you know, actually lived during this time. They were married during this time, you know, different type records that prove that they were actual people, you know, back in the 17th century or whatever. So, Now, do you believe, though, that, uh, I mean, this is where I hear a lot of the religious fight and debate come in, is that that's the sign that uh, demons are at work, because, of course, they would know that stuff to give the information to the host who thinks that they're living or have lived a past life. My question is, what what would become, is it just the fact that then it's mucking with theology and that's what they want, is they want you to end up questioning God? Is that why they would make you believe that you're reincarnated, to try to confuse you? Sometimes that can be true. Um, people will think they're hearing voices or something of an angelic nature when it turns out to be something totally different. What mm-hmm. they try to do is get the person's guard down where that entity can gain some foothold and trust with the person because they have to have the free will permission to come into that person, even though it may be kind of unknowingly or unconsciously, if that makes any sense. Sure. You know, therefore, they can step into this person or gain some foothold or ground with them. And they think, like, oh, I'm remembering, you know, reincarnation memories, these type things. So they're kind of going along with it. Kind of the same thing goes along with some of the um, abduction type theories. Right. You know, you'll hear people say, like, oh, the demons, or not the demons, but the um, aliens come in, abducted me, did all this kind of stuff. And then after a while, they just get used to it and they go along with it. And we have, there's actually some. Reported instances like with MUFON and so forth, where calling upon the name of Jesus Christ and so forth, has stopped the abductions. Hmm. Really? Okay. Well, that's what I was going to ask now. If during a hypnotic regression, because demons don't like Jesus, <laughs> they, they, no. they, they got a bone against him. Is it? Can you ask the the? Or is this a way to test it, then, if the, you know, your your father Andrew called her, but now we're checking back and you were actually, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy in your past life, and we're going through this, can we then say, John Kennedy, we'd like you to call out the name of Jesus Christ? Is that a way to test it? And if it won't call out the name Jesus Christ, is that usually a sign that it's a demonic influence? No, not necessarily, because if, you know, if in that lifetime they didn't believe in Jesus Christ, they were atheist or, you know, had other... Um, religious denominations backgrounds they may not, may not believe in Jesus for whatever reasons 
But you also have to understand that sometimes the psychiatrist and so forth like that prefer more to stick to a clinical type basis instead of calling on theology and stuff like that. So it may be difficult to do that at best, if that makes sense. But do you think that that would be a a way for people to test if it is truly demonic in nature? I understand what you're saying that there, you know, if if my past life was an atheist, I wouldn't call upon Jesus. But you know, a lot of people during the 1700s, 1800s, you know, early 1900s, you know, had strong faith and backgrounds. So the chances are that you know they they would have some kind of deal if if the the person is afraid to even say the name Jesus Christ. Would that be something then that would send up a signal in your mind as an exorcist that, hey, this might be something we want to look into? Possibly. Okay. Possibly. Um, sometimes you'll find that the the demonic will not, they don't necessarily have to respond because you say the name Jesus Christ. They can leave and oh. not give you any signs at all. Okay. So that doesn't necessarily give you a, a guaranteed response. Oh, those demons are such cheaters, Tim. They are. I don't get it. They are. Well, you know, we got to take our first break here real quick, Father Caller. Stick with us, and thank you all for tuning in. Stick with us. We're going to be back with more. And if you have questions and you'd like to ask Father Calder uh, questions about the religious aspect of uh, the paranormal, feel free to come into our live chat room. You can talk to Tim there or uh, PM me. And then uh, you can also email your questions to Tim at Darkness Radio. Tim's nodding. That would be the better way to go because I guess he's having problems getting into the chat room. So Tim at DarknessRadio.com. Click your questions in. And if you have questions for our next guest about UFOs, aliens, things like that, you can also send more questions over to Tim at Darkness Radio. We'll be back with more right after this. Are UFOs real? Does Bigfoot exist? Was Emily Rose really possessed? Who is the next American Idol? She bang, she bang. Oh, baby, but she moves, she moves. Thank I'm wasted you. by the way Thank she... you. We try to answer these questions and more each week on the darkness on the edge of town. For 58 years, fate has consistently supplied its loyal readership with a broad array of true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate is a factual magazine containing articles by experts in all walks of life and by others just like you who have something dynamic, significant, and truthful to say. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, archaeological hotspots, alternative science, and much, much more. To receive your free Fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit our website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730 or www.fatemag.com. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Are you tired of reading about what couple in Hollywood is breaking up or divorcing? Have you ever wondered where you can find the news that covers the subjects that you are really interested in? I would like to invite you to visit SupernaturalNews.com. Supernatural News uses the latest internet technology to search for the topics we know you will be interested in reading. News of the latest Bigfoot, UFO, or Loch Ness monster sightings. Read about the latest conspiracy theories and urban legends. Supernatural News, where belief and reality merge. If you want to listen, it's your funeral. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. (laughs) Good evening and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Our guest this evening is Father Andrew Calder, and he is... uh, Talking to us tonight about the religious aspects of the paranormal and what are the beliefs of the church, and he's also discussing his own personal beliefs. And, uh, you know, I had a question that popped up from one of the uh, listeners here during the break, Father Calder. They want to know, what is the church's stance on uh, on cryptozoological creatures like Bigfoot and Nessie? My guess is that they're not going to recognize them until they're willing to start tithing. Exactly. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> but they're not going to rule it out because they still might need that 10%. Is that what you think? Uh, I don't know about that. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as cryptozoology and stuff like that, you know, a lot of this stuff has come into existence long after the Bible was written. Right. Um, there's no evidence within the Bible of speaking anything like the Yeti, you know, you know, um, the Loch Ness Monster, you know, any of those type things. So there's really nothing said in the Bible about that could give you any ideas on cryptozoology. I'm sorry to say that, my friends, but... 
Well, on the other side of it, there's no mention of the platypus in the Bible either. Well, of course. They exist, so, of course. Right. You know, that just could be the way that they just didn't think it was worthy of mention because they were just part of God's creatures and just going forward. Do you think that there's any chance that there really is creatures like a Bigfoot or, or Nessie or the Mothman, or do you think, again, these might be just tricks of the devil? Well, we're, co- we're constantly discovering new species. Mm-hmm of animals, you know, things in the deep sea that's never been discovered before. we got more technology now than we've ever had in our past past history. So I think, you know, that there's a possibility they could be a species of um, animal, ape, whatever it is, you know, something like the missing link out there that could be something along these lines. But until they find, you know, more solid evidence, like, you know, if they could ever capture one of these things or something, you know, it's going to be pretty difficult to prove or disprove, you know, with just a footprint or whatever. Sure. Now, let me ask you about ghosts. We alluded to that. We, I know most churches, the pastors are ready to go do blessings on homes. <laughs> is that a belief that there really is uh, ghosts and paranormal activity, or is that just a soothing point the church does as a, you know, byproduct of, of you being a member? If you're feeling uncomfortable, the church will come and just bless your home and make you feel better. Typically, most pastors, priests, ministers, whatever you want to call them out there, believe that ghosts are not human-based entities, that they're the demonic trying to delude or deceive the human in the home into thinking that they're mom-and-pop ghosts and allowing them to be there. And that does happen sometime. But I have to admit, in my years of experience of working through paranormal investigations then eventually becoming clergy myself, I know that there are presences out there that is not demonic, not malevolent, not evil. You know, I've actually seen, you know, evidence pictures, you know, audio, video, everything else, it seems to prove that there seems to be some, you know, living after death, after we pass on. So that's, that tends to be the, the recognition that most of the pastors give out there, but unfortunately it's not correct. Well, let me ask you this, though. This is the thing I don't understand. You know, I understand free will to a, to a point, mm-hmm. and God, you know, according to the Bible, gave us free will. Right. Upon our death, why I, I can't believe that there's a free will of a child to stay here and feel lonely and lost as well, a spirit. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our God loves us enough that he continues to allow us to have free will even after we die. We won't have free will now when the end time comes. Mm-hmm. We'll have to go where we're supposed to go. But until that time, people can still remain here if they choose to. And many times a child don't know they're dead. They will tend to hang around the old home place. Right. Continue. But wouldn't, that life be, wouldn't you believe that a God that's so loving and giving, and I'm not putting uh, God on, on trial here, but I'm just curious, this is the, the main problem I've always had with that. If, if God is so good and great, if this child is afraid and doesn't realize he's dead, why haven't the angels come and comforted him and taken him to see Grandpa and Grandma or, you know, spot the family dog that passed away? Why haven't they taken him someplace on instead of leaving him terrified on some plane that nobody can hear him or, or converse with him? Well, one of the major major things I run into, and nothing against you, Dave, sure. is that most people want instantaneous gratification. They think God should do everything for us. You know, mm-hmm. why, why does God allow children to starve to death in India? And, you know, why does people get killed? You know, yada, yada, yada. It goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, you know, man usually is the culprit of all evil on the face of earth. Right. God didn't create it. Man has created it. Um Children, you know, people, the sick, you know, we make choices every single day that determines where we're going to be. And even a child does that. You know, I can't say that it's right that a child still stays here, but unfortunately sometimes that happens. You know, when when God gives you free will, we could be like the way Satan wanted us. Satan wanted to enslave all of us, Mm -hmm. make us slaves, do his bidding and so forth. But God said no and gave us free will. He also gave the angels free will, or else Satan and them could not have rebelled in heaven. Mm. Well, with children spirits especially, you know, a lot of experts, uh, you know, self-proclaimed experts in the field have said that there are no spirits of children. Those, in fact, are demonic in nature trying to trick us because what's more helpless and what are you more willing to allow into your home or allow into your life or to work with you than the spirit of a, a lost, lonely child? doing the investigations that you've done and, you know, working in the field of demonology as you have, would you say that that is probably a lot more prevalent than actual real spirits of children that are still walking the earth? I would say no, because I do feel that they are human spirits that still exist here, even children. But 
one of the problems I run into is that we, we as human beings, we, our humanity and stuff tends to go out to a child easier than it would to a, an adult or something of that nature. Right. Our defenses go down and going, oh, it's a precious little child. So they allow it to be there. And sometimes it may be an actual spirit. Sometimes it may be something pretending to be a child. Right. And therefore we let our guard down and we let it in unknowingly and we allow it to stay in our home. And ultimately, once it's in our home, it ultimately, the grand scheme of things, is ultimately to possess someone. So that's not really a clear-cut answer on the child issue. It can go either way. What have you found personally with with the investigations that you've done? Have you found that it's been more of a demonic nature yourself, or have you found it to be, or are you finding an even split down the middle of it being a real spirit? And, And how do you differentiate between the two? I would we have to understand, Dave, over the years, I have kind of become a repository for malevolent bad cases. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know. in the beginning, we got what I call mom-and-pop ghost cases, but as time has went on over the years, and especially after I became ordained, I tend to get nothing but probably 98%, you know, bad cases now. Mm-hmm. Um, people come to us looking for help because they don't know where else to go to. It's not like every every church on every corner out there knows exactly what to do with these cases. That's They're not. True. They're not taught in seminary. They're, they're given very little information on how to deal with these type of spirits to begin with. So when people call up their local priest, pastor, clergy, or whatever, you know, first thing they tell them is they're crazy. You know, they need to get psychological help. Mm-hmm. You know, they're kind of brushed off. And this family may be actually suffering. I mean, being tormented day and night, different family members. So over the years, we we do we have come to be deal with negative, malevolent, don- demonic cases. And I forgot what question you asked me, Dave. <laughs> well, I was just curious if, if you found that in your investigation of especially children's spirits, how many have actually turned out to be real children's spirits? How many have turned out to be mnemonic in nature? And how can maybe we as the lay people tell the difference between the two? Okay. I would say it's probably a 50-50 split on that. Okay. Um, as far as lay people knowing some of the telltale signs of a demonic infestation or haunting, um some of the typical things right off the top of my head one is smells of excrement rotting flesh these type of things are not going to be associated with a human spirit okay um things happening in series of threes like they hear rappings knockings you know phenomena happening at three o'clock in the morning um excrement appearing three times in the house on the floor you know, three is a direct blasphemy of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that's why the demonic does this. Um, so if you're hearing or seeing three of a kind, three uh, three of a kind, all of a sudden, now I'm going to be afraid to play <laughs> poker, Father Calder. Nice job. No, but, that's, that's, that's where people have <laughs> got to kind of take it with a, a know, grain of salt. I know, but I mean, if you, but usually if it's rapping, so you're saying if it's just kind of a obscure rapping, it could be a ghost, but usually if it's done in, in series of threes, but isn't that tipping their hat to us then, knowing that, that they're kind of trapped into that illusion? They don't always have to do that, but tip that that happens in more cases than you than you imagine. Okay. Um, also, um, phantom mania, as it's known, or sleep paralysis, that happens quite a bit in negative cases. Okay. Where, where people will be, they'll wake up, they're frozen in the bed, something will be sitting on their chest. Sometimes they can see it, sometimes they cannot. I've had a number of females dealing with incubi type um, entities talk about, you know, it looked like a big scaly lizard that was sitting on their chest. Um, nightmares, um, usually of something chasing the people, but they can never see what it is. Hmm. Um, all this, all this happens very frequently in negative type cases. So those are some typical signs you can look for. I know in your your bio that we right at the beginning of the show, it mentioned something about Ouija boards. Mm-hmm. And I know that this last week they did a big, uh, or they were going to do a big um, test on, on the show Coast to Coast uh, with George Norrie mm-hmm. uh, with Ouija board. And the, the concern went out that people were worried that just listening to somebody use the Ouija board and what was going on could open up negative influences in your own home. We all know the story of the movie Exorcist where the little girl's screwing around with the the Ouija board and hearing from Captain Howdy, and then all right. of a sudden her possession starts. What's your official take on the Ouija board? Is well, it nothing more than a game by Parker's, Parker Brothers, and we allow ourselves psychotically to manifest these things? 
Or is it, in fact, a conduit to naughty places we shouldn't be messing with? Well, Ouija boards are oracle boards, as they've been known throughout the ages, have been around for thousands of years. Um, they've been found in ancient Egyptian tombs, you know, with different mummies and things of that nature. So Parker ain't got a corner on the market. <laughs> you know, they're just the first one to capitalize on it and make <laughs> money from it. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, it is a tool that can open up doorways from the spirit world into people's lives without them knowing it, thinking it's a simple little toy. Um, I'll be the first one to tell people, I played with it when I was a kid, but I was lucky, never got myself in trouble with it. And then there's other people do it one time, and boom, all hell breaks loose in their house. You know, it's kind of a, you know, you t- you're, it's kind of like Russian roulette. You're taking your chances by doing it. I've worked a number of really bad cases of people just playing around with Ouija boards. So in your opinion... Throw them out, destroy them. Do you break them? Do you burn them? Do you just give them to the garbage? Do you give them to Salvation Army and let somebody else take the problem? What's the story? My my first thought for most people is you can find something better to do than go buy a Ouija board. Right. You know, first send, of all, don't send your buy money it. to me. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> exactly. I'd be happy to take your money for you. Know? <laughs> but you know, don't buy them in the first place if you've already got them. You know, get rid of them. You know, because you never know. Especially children, you know, they do stuff playing around with things. And children are more psychically sensitive, so to speak, than adults are. Mm-hmm. So they're more vulnerable to any type passing spirit coming by. And even human spirits, you know, can cause you problems as well. You know, they refuse to leave or whatever. So it's not just the demonic ones you have to worry about. You can bring in a whole host of things by using these things. All right, so it's better just to avoid them. What What do you recommend for people that own one now, though? I mean, we've heard so many rumors and, and things. If you break them, it'll trap the spirits that you've, you've brought in here. If you burn them, it'll do the same. Is there a good way to dispose of a Ouija board and not give it on to somebody else? Well, if you've got one that's brought in spirits and so forth like that, one of the best ways I've ever heard is to either bury it or to drop it into running water. You know, some, supposedly this has been something around for hundreds of years that, you know, spirits can't cross running water. Okay. Um, that's one way to deal with it. Um, one is one is to take it to your local clergy, let them do whatever they need to with it. Some of them bless it. Some of them, you know, will do whatever they need to to get rid of it. So that's one way. I know in some areas people have left the Ouija boards on the front steps of the church. What about a blessing? What if I took my brand new Ouija board to the church and asked it to be blessed? Would then that bring me only good spirits and able to communicate that way? There's no guarantee of that because you're acting as the medium. Okay. You know, the energy is coming through you. Sure. So, you know, blessing the Ouija board is not going to guarantee you anything. So the Ouija board, avoid that because you're asking the spirit to come through you to move the planchette. So it's safe, though, that we can maintain using the Magic 8-Ball, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. <laughs> See, Tim, I told you, there's no demonic problems with Magic 8-Ball. <laughs> I knew it. (laughs) Will Tim get asked to prom? Ask again later. Oh, dang. We hate that answer. All right, so uh, there's a stance on Ouija board. Now let me, uh, we we do have to take one more quick break. We'll be back, and then I want to talk to you about uh, UFOs and see what the, What's going on in there? Because there's been a lot of debate that the Bible mentions UFOs. And Mm -hmm. let's see what your thoughts are. We'll be back with more. And Father Calder, right after this. It will keep you on the edge of your seat. I must have drank me about 15 Dr. Peppers. I got to pay. Just don't get any on the floor. Hurry back. There is more to come from the darkness on the edge of town. For 58 years, fate has consistently supplied its loyal readership with a broad array of true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate is a factual magazine containing articles by experts in all walks of life and by others just like you who have something dynamic, significant, and truthful to say. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, archaeological hotspots, alternative science, and much, much more. To receive your free Fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730. Or visit our website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. Or www.fatemag.com. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. If you read read Taps Paramag every month, month, you'll you'll be be able able to tell the difference between the absurd and the creepy. (laughs) Taps Paramag takes you where few would ever go. On purpose. (laughs) From exclusive interviews with the cast of The Ghost Hunters to the latest trends in technology in the field of the paranormal. To join our journey, order at tapsparamag.com. 
Are you tired of reading about what couple in Hollywood is breaking up or divorcing? Have you ever wondered where you can find the news that covers the subjects that you are really interested in? I would like to invite you to visit SupernaturalNews.com. Supernatural News uses the latest internet technology to search for the topics we know you will be interested in reading. News of the latest Bigfoot, UFO, or Loch Ness monster sightings. Read about the latest conspiracy theories and urban legends. Supernatural News, where belief and reality merge. In the Amityville heart, a ghost told them to get out the house. White people stayed in there. Now that's a hint and a half for your ass. A ghost say get the f out, I would just tip the f out the door. They walked and looked in the toilet bowl with blood in the toilet. They said, that's peculiar. I would have been in the house and said, oh baby, this is beautiful. We got a chandelier hanging up here, kids outside playing in a beautiful neighborhood. We ain't got nothing to wear. I really love them. This is really nice. Too bad we can't stay, baby. We're the type of guys who would have stayed just for the extra company. Welcome back to the darkness on the edge of town. Hey, welcome back to the show. This is Dave and Tim sitting in with you on Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio. Our guest is Father Andrew Calder. He's been sharing uh, kind of a religious aspect and view of the paranormal. Before we went to a break, I alluded to the fact we'd like to talk to you a little bit about UFOs and aliens, Father Calder. Now, Okay. As I said, you know, the ufologists quote states, you know, statements from the Bible that they feel are thinly cloaked, uh, you know, uh, references to UFOs. There's famous Renaissance art that has UFOs in it, beaming lights into Jesus Christ's forehead and, and you know, bathing uh, Mary in light. And, and there's also a belief that it was a UFO that led the wise men to Christ's birth. What what is the official stance of the church that you're aware of on UFOs? As far as I'm concerned, I don't know of any official stance that the church takes on it, but they are correct that there are some some passages and so forth, you know, within the text that, you know, speak loosely about possibly other civilizations, other races, you know, similar to ours out there. And I can't deny the fact that, you know, our God, you know, could have created other you know, intelligent life forms out there besides us. Man is not the only intelligent life form in the universe, I don't believe. All right. Do you believe that, uh, in your opinion, do you believe that we are, in fact, dealing with UFOs and alien presence on, on our planet here? To some degree, I think we have, you know, throughout the ages. I think some of the stuff that the prehistoric man has a experience, you know, the cave drawings and so forth that shows cylindrical objects, you know, odd saucer-type things, and also some of the land um, glyphs and everything of that nature that's way too big for us to even know what they are except from a very high aerial view and during that time we didn't have airplanes so I would think this would prove you know, throughout time that they've at least visited us to some degree What about your theory too on you know this is it's always interested me is a lot of people you know will the way they talk about aliens is also the way a lot of uh, religious people talk about um, angel encounters Mm-hmm. Uh, even the the famous story of the you know Our Lady of Fatima, where the uh, apparition of of Mary appeared to these children, she appeared in a light glowing like, like almost like an alien look, and uh, you know the people that could see things saw light bright you know bright light entity standing there before them. Do you believe that it is more religious in nature, alien, or do you believe that again it could just be the trick of the devil screwing around with us? Well, you have to understand the devil and the demonic is an opportunistic predator. Okay. He's going to take advantage of any type of weakness that, that is in our lives, just like talking about the alien situation. Um, there's so many people over the years, especially in the past 10 to 20 years, that's come to grip, you know, saying, like, yes, there is other life forms out there. Yes, they are the grays. They are this type of life form. So I feel that some of them have begun to tap into that and take advantage of it of people that just you know believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that these entities exist. And as, as I said before, MUFON has some recorded, actual documented cases of where these abductions and so forth have been stopped by calling upon a religious name like Jesus Christ. What, what do you feel with the, the way the paranormal has taken off here in the last five, six years? I mean, I know that it's always been popular in kind of a cult-like sect, you know, where people like to read Stephen King books and Dean Koontz books and go see a good scary movie. But now, 
Uh, it seems the lid has been removed from Pandora's box, and the supernatural and paranormal isn't an everyday occurrence for us. You know, I mean, it's water cooler talk now, where it used to be in hushed tones, only with close friends and relatives, that you would admit that things like this. Do you do you believe that we're opening up uh, a world of trouble for ourselves with uh, you know demonic and with other uh, uh, evil entities out there? I think it's a sign of our times. Um, you know, about every five to ten years, you find a wave or growth of the amount of people that's interested in the paranormal, the metaphysical, you know, trying to find themselves, you know, spiritually, this type thing. And I think you've just got a lot of people right now that is very interested in the paranormal, especially due to shows like, you know, Taps, you know, Ghost Hunters, these type things. They've kind of put it in mom and pop's home every day, you know. Right. So that's one of the main reasons why you have so many people out there. Well, what can you do to tell us, you know, a lot of people want to be protected when they're going out to investigate. Now, first of all, what would you tell people that are interested in becoming ghost hunters? Uh, what What is your honest take on doing that type of investigative work? I think it can be very productive. It can be, you can gain up quite a bit of evidence doing this, but about like everything else, it has its drawbacks, its pros and cons. And one of the main problems I have with most of these groups out there is they jump into it before they know what they start, what they're doing. Um, you know, everything out there is not good. You know, it's not just like mom and pop ghosts running around everywhere you go out there. They are some negative ones out there waiting for you to make a mistake, right? To trip up and take advantage of that. I tell most people, you know, you really need to have a good faith system, one that has a higher divine being in it. Um, prayer before and after an investigation, I find, is always very, very important to keep any type of attachments, any human or inhuman ghost or spirit trying to attach to you and or any of your team members. Um, things like different medals, you know, St. Michael, St. Benedict, um, a whole host of others that you, know, you can have blessed by your local priest. These can help provide some form of protection to your members as well. Um, but prayer is utmost of importance. And is there a basic type of prayer that you would recommend people could say before and after an investigation to make sure that they're not taking home anything negative with them? Typically, I tell people prayer from your heart, you know, from you know, just just from within yourself, spoken verbally, not mentally. Mentally, don't do very good. You know, spoken word has a lot of power to it. You know, when we do an exorcism, we don't do it mentally; we do it verbally. Right. Because of that fact. Um, just speaking from your heart, you know, asking God, you know, for his help, his protection, provide the angels to protect you and keep back any type of negative malevolent energies that may be trying to attach or come home with you. Also, too, they can use written ones like the St. Michael's Prayer, which is pretty common these days on the Internet, can be extremely helpful as well. Now, you mentioned something really important, though, that, that it comes from the heart. Right. You know, a lot of people I hear, you know, Oh, St. Michael will protect us and uh, enslave the devil from us. Uh, right, uh, amen. Right. Is that doing any good, even reciting that because well, of the power of St. Michael's prayer? Is it automatically giving us a shield of protection? Or if you're not feeling it, you're just like, you know, my kids at dinner. Okay, let's say <coughs> prayers. Okay, uh, God bless us for our food. Amen. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's no thought into what we're saying or what we're doing. We're just going through a ritual. Is, yeah, I, t- I tend to agree with you on that. Um, there has to be some heart, some oomph behind it, as I call it. Okay. Um, there has to be some meaning there. You can't just, you know, spout out the words or to be just like the, you know, the the men in the Bible that tried to cast out in the name of Jesus that didn't believe in him. Right. Um, you really, you really do have to, you know, even sing the St. Michael's Prayer, have to have some belief there. Okay. Um, that's what I tell people. I said, if you're atheist or something like that, I would recommend you find some <laughs> Some, religion, Some other man. work, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because yeah. there's, you know, if you don't believe in any type of divine God, there's not much much help for you there, you know. <laughs> that is true, but there is so people should be aware that just reciting words that are written on a on a, a tapestry your grandmother knitted for you doesn't necessarily mean that that you're safe. You should actually put some thought and belief and understanding into the words that you're saying. Exactly. Okay, and I want that to be a stress point because I do see so many people at our events and, and at other events that uh, will just quote Bible Mary passages. Grace, right, yeah. and I don't even, th- you know, it's like they're on autopilot. I don't know that they even know what they're actually saying. They're just, you know, robots stating right. something they have to. I think they could have said the national anthem, and, and it would have had the same impact on the spirits. Does that sure. work? Yes, yes, it does, Tim. <laughs> Little known fact, just by reciting 
the national anthem, the demons will leave you alone. That's right. Yes. That's right. Tried it many times. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Father Calder, if people want help from you, we've got about 30 seconds left. How can they reach you? What's the best way to go about getting in touch with you? I have two avenues. One is through my Georgia Paranormal website. That's www.georgiaparanormal, and all that's spelled out, dot com. We have links on there. We have forms people can fill out if they're having problems in their lives. You know, submit it to us. We'll definitely get in touch with them, see what we can set up for them to help them out. Also, too, I have another one at www.myspace.com slash Andrew Calder. This is more geared toward the clergy exorcism side if um, people is needing help in that area as well. Yes, because MySpace is the best place to go find clergy exorcisms. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if people, you can also get really good discounts on Domino's Pizza there. Hey. But uh, <laughs> Father Calder, thank you for spending time with us this evening. We'd we'll definitely love to have you back in the future to talk more about your uh, your independent cases that you've worked on with demonology. Sure. And we thank all of you for tuning in. Stick with us. We're going to be back after the top of the hour with our next guest, James Gilliland from the East City UFO Ranch out in Trout Lake, Washington. He's going to tell us about some new uh, advances that are being made, some new contacts that have been made, and more. So stick with us. We'll be back right after this.